I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast, Rob. Today, we have a special guest back on the podcast. Welcome back to the podcast, Professor Roy Chan. We had Roy on for an earlier discussion of the introduction to Lu Xun's Nahan. And uh, we've got him back for what I have called my favorite work of modern Chinese literature, which is Wild bold Grass. Claim. Yeah, it's all, I know it's a bold claim, but I, I think I think I can back it up. So welcome back, Roy. Uh, nice to be back here with you all. Thank you so much, Professor Jan, for coming on. And uh, so as I said, we're talking about Wild Grass. Now, this is one of those works, one of many works, but usually if you're looking to to kind of trouble the narrative about Lu Xun, the received narrative of the great revolutionary voice that was awakening the Chinese spirit, Wild grass tends to be the first stumbling block because people tend to think they have a pretty good handle on, say, Diary of a Madman or The True Story of IQ, which are far more complicated than they are popularly presented. But anyway, wild grass is a very different beast. Roy, do you have at your fingertips any kind of background info you want to share on Wild Grass? Wild Grass is a collection of about 27 short, uh, what's known as sanwanshi or prose poem pieces. So these are short vignettes. They're written in prose, um, but they're highly imagistic, symbolic, strange, odd, um, featuring all kinds of dreams, fantasias, nightmares, uh, observations. And these were initially published serially uh, in the press, uh, in particular in a uh, magazine, a newspaper known as Yusu, uh, between 1924 and around 1926 and so on. Uh, and then around 1926, 1927, he collects the vignettes into a volume and publishes that under the title Ye Tao, uh, which is conventionally translated as wild grass, but there is this huge debate among scholars of whether it's really wild grass, which is a kind of lyrical translation, or if it should be the more vernacular title weeds. And so uh, I believe there's a, a very recent uh, English language translation that's coming out or is out that uses the vernacular uh, quotidian weeds as the uh, translation of the title. You know, talking about a stumbling block, I think everyone stumbles over wild grass. I think in many ways, it's kind of one of the uh, features, one of the nice features of this text. This is not a text that's referential. This is not a text that can be easily mapped to some kind of historical circumstance. Surely there probably were historical and biographical circumstances that, uh, you know, motivated the writing of some of these pieces. But for, for the most part, it has absolutely stymied everyone's, uh, every scholar's ability to interpret or make sense of it. Uh, and I think that's on purpose. So, uh, Rob, you talked about kind of how when we teach Lucian in the American classroom and certainly in the PRC classroom, uh, we teach Lucian as kind of this, this historical figure who's trying to awaken the Chinese people, trying to reveal uh, what's going on in China and so on and so forth. And certainly when I teach Lucian in the American undergraduate classroom, you do that, right? Because he is talking about China. He is talking about the situation there. So what do you do with a text that makes no clear reference except in the very beginning or the very end to the present situation, right? How do we make sense of really this fantasia on words that Lucian is doing? Uh, and for those who think that Lucian is some kind of um, standard critical realist, uh, this text is, is gonna blow that assumption up. But then some have argued that this shows that Lucian was secretly, he was really a, a modernist, uh, a really a symbolist at heart. That's who he really was. And I, I not, I don't agree with that position either. I think what we see of Lucian is someone who is truly quite hybrid, who really has all of these registers and styles um, in his hands that he can play with, that he can do things with. Which, thinking about kind of the infancy of the modern Bai Hua in the 1920s, uh, I know Nick Admison has really written about this, kind of the innovations of this new literary vernacular written standard. Lucian is many, in many ways is just pushing the bounds of what you can do with this supposedly national language, a language that they hoped would be the national lingua franca. Uh, what kinds of, you know, formal terrains can you push this Bai Hua into? Uh, and that's kind of what makes it interesting. 
The other thing I want to point out, of course, you know, I, I wrote about uh, Yatao in my book on dreams is that it features a lot of dreams. Um, a lot of the uh, pieces themselves are framed uh, within the narrative or the, or the conceit of a dream, uh, but not every poem is a dream. On the other hand, you can argue that the whole work, the whole collection constitutes a certain kind of dreamlike uh, uh, text where you're not really sure where you are. There's a sense of deep disorientation where you're not sure where time is and where space is. And I think um, this is perhaps Lucian's most speculative work. And I think it goes to show how important it was for Lucian, not just simply to critique reality or to be referential in that sense, but the necessity of that kind of speculative moment of imagination, of feeling, of even hallucination, themselves as meaningful and critical foils on the present. So you mentioned that there is this conceit that the whole entirety of Ye Tao might be a dream. Is the the beginning, the, the first prose poem that begins the collection and the last, the final prose poem, Those there is the sense that both of those are kind of this going to sleep and waking up. Yes. So the first, uh, and these, you know, the very first piece and the very last piece, I believe were written in the end, right? When he's trying to kind of bookend all of these serialized pieces and, and, and kind of give it a tentative formal structure, right? So we think of formal structure as something that makes a nice little package of this so that you can kind of give this as a book, as a gift to your lover, right? You want it to have a kind of packaging, a beginning and an end, right? But on the other hand, we can also think about the ways in which this is a very provisional formal packaging that in many ways that um, uh, to say that there is some kind of uh, neat coherence uh, is not true either. But you're absolutely right. It begins with a piece called Autumn Night, uh, which features the poet who might be Lucian, uh, contemplating his surroundings at night, dragging on a cigarette and, and falling to sleep, right? The last piece that ends uh, the collection is Yi Jie, or Awakening, uh, which features him um, awakening, so to speak. And this is the most referential of all of the prose poems. He talks about being in his study. He talks in Beijing uh, when a civil war is going on between different warlord factions, there's aerial raids. Uh, he talks about how, you know, on his bed, it's just um, covered with all of the recent uh, copies of newspapers that are talking about all of the um, national and local affairs, right? So this is very referential. And it's really interesting because some of these pieces take place when the poet is sleeping. Here you have the newspapers on the bed, right? It's just kind of covering that space. Um, but then at the end of that piece, he falls back to sleep and has a dream. We don't know what the dream is, but it just ends on that note. So it ends with dreaming again. So, so what I just said is kind of like neat packaging of beginning and end is it's up subverted because in the very end, he goes back into dreaming. Now, for those of, the, of, of us who want to think of Lucian as a realist, realism has a really problematic uh, relationship to uh, the issues of sleep and dream, right? Because the whole point of realism is to observe, to observe, to expose, to critique. So tropes of light, of exposure, um, of vision are extremely powerful uh, in realism because it's taking back on a certain kind of enlightenment narrative, right, of progress, of critique, of secular reason. Uh, so what does it mean to have a text that emphasizes the state of sleeping and dreaming and Dead. And this is something that Lucian always played with, not just in 1924, uh, 1925, but earlier than that, he's thinking about that dialectic between dreaming and awakening and the ways that these two things are not opposites necessarily, but they actually condition one another. You can't understand waking reality without thinking about the fact that we spend a third, hopefully, of our lives asleep. And you can't understand the quality and, 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 and structure of our sleep without contrasting it with our daily life. Uh, and so th these are thoughts that Lucian had always had. Uh, we see it in the preface to Nahan, which begins with uh, a discussion of dreams. Uh, he translates the very speculative, uh, dreamy fairy tales of the Russian anarchist writer Vasily Yereshenko, 
these were uh, fairy tales written predominantly in Japanese or Esperanto, and he translated them to Japanese. Uh, and, he, and he gives a preface where he thinks about what is the value of the dreams of Yeroshenka, right? So he's, he's always been engaged in that blurring line between a uh, dream and reality as a way to better understand the present. And it's an interesting way of complicating the perspective from which someone might critique, say, China. Because as you mentioned, you know, I think it's a good point that we can't say that Lu Xun is purely a speculative writer because he was very, very concerned about where China was going. But it's interesting to consider from what point he undertook his critiques, right? Because if the point from which he undertook them is a position where dreams are equally valid, well, that's a very different place than, say, an Emile Zola. Right, someone, someone who is trying to present society, quote unquote, as it is. Uh, Lu Xun's society, as it is, also includes things that happen when no one can even see them or witness them. Right. Well, let me just add there. I think you know one of the things that bedeviled intellectuals of the May Fourth, uh, and particularly someone like Lu Xun, um, is how to understand the past and how to understand the future. These were things that were of paramount importance. What was China's future under conditions of semi-colonialism, under conditions of revolution, of nationalism, uh, on one hand. And on the other hand, how was one to take, make sense of the past, of, of tradition, of 4,000 years, 5,000 years of civilization? Uh, these were really difficult questions. And these are, you can argue that these are at heart speculative questions. How do we make sense of the past uh, that, that we inherit? And how do we make sense of a future uh, that, isn't, that, that we don't know yet, that we can't necessarily uh, foresee? Even more importantly is that the present itself is speculative. How do we make sense of the now? And if anything, what Lucian shows is that what's the most bedeviling and the most confusing is not the past or the future, it's the now of China. What does it mean to be in a China that has extraterritoriality, different systems of law uh, coinciding, um, different uh, regimes of truth? all happening simultaneously. So the real Gordian and not wasn't what was our past or what will we become, is who are we now? Uh, and it's not so simple as a simple critical referential realist narrative. Absolutely not. Um, it, 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 you have to engage that difficulty, the naughtiness of the present. And I think that's what Lucian's speculative vision allows us to do. Um, you know, Rob, you worked with Lucian's translation of Zhu Van, uh, Lucian's translation of speculative fiction, right, in the Lei Qing. And so he's always been really been interested of kind of how do we shake up ways of thinking our present in order to know it anew and to know it better. Yeah. Professor Chan, we've kind of gestured towards this in this podcast and in other podcasts, but the, the standard reading of Lu Xun today in the PRC is that Lu Xun is about saving China from the grips of tradition and kind of bringing China into a modern form. Is there any of that in in this prose poem? I mean, I think of the the Yi Jue, the, the awakening, where he, he kind of wakes up with the bombs falling, and then you're right, he I hadn't thought about that, but he goes back to sleep. It's almost like he's ignoring the fractured state of politics in China and just kind of is is he ignoring that? Is he kind of is he abandoning something he thought was important before or is he saying something quite different? I, I just don't know what to make of it. Yeah. Um, so I don't think he's an, uh, ignoring it. Um, I think he's very well aware of it. But I think the other thing is Lu Xun is very modest about what a writer can do. So one of the, the, the debates he's having in the, in the late 20s and 30s are with, say, the proletarian writers who thought that you could literally make a revolution through writing. And, and they were you know, inspired by the Japanese and by certain Soviet uh, counterparts. And Lu Xun was very skeptical of this. Uh, you know, he thought that many of these, these so-called revolutionary writers were not revolutionary at all, that these were basic self-promoters. You know, they had found some, you know, like you think about contemporary criticisms of wokeness, right? You know, they, they hopped on a bandwagon and, and they were hoping that this would kind of make their careers. And then once the political winds shifted, they abandoned that, right? So Lu Xun was very um, critical of the conceit that an author through his pen can change the world. He was very well aware that that does not happen. 
That doesn't mean that one shouldn't write or that he was going to abandon his writerly career and become revolutionary. He does think that writing is important. He does think that writing has a role to play, but it needs to know its own limits. It, it can't supplant actual revolutionaries, right? And so he always says that, you know, um, uh, revolutionary literature is almost like an oxymoron because revolution doesn't happen in literature. It happens in, in reality, it happens in the streets, right? And so in the last piece, you know, yes, he falls back to sleep, but before he does that, he spends the whole night editing the work of younger authors. So there's almost a presentiment of his own passing, of his own kind of obsolescence. But how is he going to be of use? He's going to be of use by being a mentor, by or being an editor to younger writers. Uh, so there is action, but it's not the kind of direct political action that you know some might hope or expect for. Lucian is always very, very circumspect about what he as a writer can actually do. Now, this is very different from, say, 1905, 1906, when he's in Japan, and he's reading all this romantic poetry, and he, and he styles himself the moral poet, and he really believes that, you know, an act of of this dank Morris Mara like poetry can like, you know, shake the world, right? You know, there's this real belief in the, in the earth shattering possibilities of poetry by the May 4th, that is pretty much gone, right? This idea that I, as a poet, am a theurge that can kind of will reality to my sense of value and norm that's gone because he, in, in the last piece of, um, in that Yijia, he says, you know, I'm reminded that wa huo zai ren jian, I live among people. I'm not just this deified poet. I live among people. I live among society. I live among reality, social actuality, right? So I think there's a little bit of um, a guardedness there that is born out of a lifetime of experience and disappointment that helps him see it that way. We've already talked about the opening and closing pieces, but when we talk to you about the wild grass and what specifically we could focus on or should focus on, those weren't necessarily the ones you recommended. The ones you selected are sort of colloquially translated Revenge 1 and Revenge 2. Like everything else in wild grass, they're very strange. If you read them out of context in the rest of the book, or heck, even if you read them in context with the rest of the book, you'll probably read them and finish and go, what just happened what here? Heck? What the, right? Which is, of course, part of the point. So first question, Roy, why these pieces? And second, how do you see them fitting with the rest of the book? Um, that's a really excellent question. Uh, so I wanted to pick pieces that I haven't worked on or read about or thought about. So, you know, my book, I, I really focus on the pieces that deal with dreams. Um, these two pieces are, are not necessarily about dreams, although one could read them as, as very dreamlike. Um, and, you know, I was struck by, by the title revenge, right? You know, revenge. Um, but how, in the first piece of Revenge, uh, which is dated in, uh, say, December 1924, you know, you have this very kind of um, impressionistic uh, abstract meditation on what it means to be a human, um, to be a human that's pulsing the flood, but also the fragility of the bounds of our embodied existence, our skin, uh, and how easily it can be pierced. Um, and so it goes from a, a uh, description of kind of the circulatory system <laughs> and of the skin uh, to a description of two people who are equally fragile, who are pointing um, sharpened daggers um, at each other, right? And we don't know what's going to happen um, and there's this, this oscillation of are they going to embrace or are they going to kill each other? And then a crowd of spectators forms to kind of, you know, they're kind of excited to see what happens, right? It's kind of like, you know, uh, watching uh, disaster videos on TikTok or YouTube. What's going to happen next, right? So there's this kind of hesitation because they're also kind of figuring out are they going to, you know, embrace or are they going to, you know, slaughter each other? No one really knows. And it ends at that moment of hesitation, that moment of, of suspension where you don't know. And he ends by saying that this is the great bliss, the great 
joy, the da, uh, da huan xi, right? The ecstasy, right? Is that moment of suspension, right? And it's a really interesting kind of piece because uh, I like how it forces us to consider the complicity of both love and violence, right? That as humans, we can um, love one another, care one another, support one another, but we can just as easily harm one another, kill one another, right? And we're always at that precipice, like he's very clear eyed about that reality. Uh, as the spectators, you know, we're always poised to gawk. I mean, I am very guilty of that with my true crime addiction. Uh, <laughs> at the same time, as we are also poised to criticize ourselves and what we are doing in that in that uh, in that situation. And so, I think you know, a word that comes to mind is complicity. The complicity of being human. The way that we're complicit to each other. The way that we are complicit in the violence that is done to others. As well, even in a certain way, in the violence that's done to ourselves, right? Um, that that Lushan is not a kind of you know there are peer victims and peer victimizers. Although he is very clear about the hierarchies of power and the hierarchies of coloniality, but he also wants to argue that everyone has a responsibility here, even the colonized, right? Um, and so I think this is something that you know this is not. You can't make a political slogan out of this, right? right? There's, there's, no, there's no way that this lends itself to a certain kind of direct political action. It's really more of a kind of speculative philosophical meditation on our mutual vulnerability to each other, the mutual precarity of what it means to be human. So the next piece, uh, which is published uh, December 20th, 1924, it's the same date that he, he writes these. Uh, revenge number two. <laughs> it's kind of like, oh, part you know. Two. Yeah. Son right. of revenge. Revenge right. of revenge. <laughs> right. It's funny because the first one doesn't say part one. It's just like, you know, one and done. You know, I, I wrote my piece. You know, this is cool. And he goes, no, nah, no, nah, I got some more. <laughs> so yeah. Revenge part two. And so this, <laughs> so now what is the relation between the two pieces? We can't assume that there's a relation. I mean, the fact that they have the same title would, it would invite one, but we can't necessarily think that it is. But, but it's a story of the passion of the Christ, of, of Jesus' uh, uh, crucifixion. And, and what is going on here, right? Uh, I found this really interesting because um, how many pieces of modern Chinese literature of the 1920s of the May 4th talk about Christ? How, how many how many pieces of modern Chinese fiction have Aramaic trans transcribed in it, right? Like it, it has question. the passage. <laughs> it has I'm, I'm going to go ahead question. and say none. Absolutely. And so why is he telling the story? Now, the un the uh, uncharitable and maybe the, the biographical explanation is to say that Lu Shen thinks of, of himself as a Christ-like figure uh, who is you know, tormented by the crowd. And, and, and you see these interpretations, right? You know, um, and, and in many ways, it's maybe just a Christian version of uh, the Mara satanic poet, right? So, you know, he's, uh, you know, he's found the light, he's been reborn, but he's still an, like, a massive egoist because now he thinks it's Jesus. Oh my gosh, <laughs> right? You can imagine that. Uh, I don't read it that way. I don't think he is. I don't think we necessarily should, should, should rely on a, on a biographical interpretation. I think, you know, in the fact that Jesus is, the, is both the son of God, but also the son of man, it's again, an allegory of everyone. We are all, Jesus reflects the human condition in his own experience, in his own body, right? And that's how I, I think is what's, is what's going on here. And what I would argue is that if the first piece was about the speculative relation between self and other, that we are united, even though we don't know if we will be united in love or if we will kill each other, annihilate each other. Uh, and so we're, we're kind of stuck and we're kind of like, we have to observe and acknowledge that uh, intimacy, right? Um, I would argue, I would suggest that in this one, it's really about the antinomy between the human and the divine. Jesus is both son of man, but also son of God. And that this antinomy of the secular and the sacred uh, is not just confined to the, to the Christ. The Christ is allegorical of all of humanity, of all of us, as we struggle between both our earthly existence, but the possibility of something more uh, divine, uh, more sacred. And I don't mean necessarily metaphysical here, but I mean more in a sense of 
the, the realm of values, the realm of norm, the realms of the ritual order that Lu Shun always had an ambivalent relationship with. On one hand, he rejected Confucianism, he rejected feudalism. On the other hand, I would argue that in some ways, he was always a Confucian. He was always someone who wanted to bring back a sense, uh, a radical sense in that way, a radical sense of imminence, a radical sense of meaning uh, that Confucius, when read speculatively, could possibly provide. And I think Eileen Cheng's work is really great in kind of showing how this, this, this sense of the normative, of the possibility of a redemptive normativity is still there in Lu Xun, even if he ostensibly rejects the past, right? Um, and so in this sense, you know, when we talk about revolution for Lu Xun, it's never just about social revolution, political revolution, as early as in Nahan, he you know, makes clear it's about spiritual revolution. Uh, what is this category of spirit? And I don't read spirit in Lucian. I don't think Lucian would have read it metaphysically. He's not talking about um, actual spirits that can be captured by a spirit box or some technology. If you're watching you know, ghost hunters kind of things, he's really talking about spirit as a kind of necessary abstraction, right? Of the of trying to express the quintessence of our nation, the quintessence of our society, the quintessence of our humanity. Uh, in other words, humanity thinking its own humanity. Right. Um, and I think that's that's kind of um, where he's kind of playing with uh, here in the, in the figure of, of, of Christ. Right. That he represents the melding of both the earthly, actual, the earthly, the banal, the quotidian, but the aspiration to something higher, the aspiration to something perhaps more transcendent, but not separated from our secular um, earthly uh, existence. So it's a really kind of um, amazing piece. And, and the fact that it features the, you know, Eloi, Eloi, uh, Lama Sabachthani, you know, why has God, why has God, oh God, why has, oh Lord, why has thou forsaken me? That comes from Psalm 22, but reappears in the Gospels of Mark and Matthew, because this is what Jesus is crying out to God. You know, why has thou forsaken me? Um, and this cry, which is not, you know, when we think about ordinary language, we, we can have you know ordinary propositions and state constative statements. This is not that. A cry, a prayer is is a performative act. It's like, you know, please hear me. Please respond to me, right? Um, and the fact that this is done in Aramaic, and you need a footnote to understand what he's saying, right? Unless you know something about the Bible at the time. Um, it's such an interesting use of the of language, right? That it's not, we're not just describing reality, narrating reality, we're using language to evoke response, right? We're using language to evoke a prayerly response to give witness to our condition, right? That's the power of that prayer. It's not so much, does God respond? You know, because obviously uh, in, in the story of crucifixion, uh, not yet, right? Not till three days after, <laughs> but, right? Um, but, but the idea that, that, that he's, he's saying that even perhaps in our ideal May 4th secular world, there is a place for prayer, not for its metaphysical function, but because of the ways in which it reveals something about our humanity and our sacredness at the same time, right? I mean, think about, you know, the, the Confucius's reinterpretation of the Joel ritual world, that what he did was he took the metaphysics out of it, but showed the symbolic meaning of sacrifice, right? The, the meaning of sacrifice is not that the gods, Tian, will bless us. It's that we reveal the best of ourselves in the reverential act of sacrifice to each other. So this is Confucius's speculative reinvention of Joel ritual, right? And I can't help but see echoes of that in Lu Xun's reading of the crucifixion. You know, he's not saying let's all become Christians. He's all, he's, what he's saying is what can the story, the story of the limits of human bonds and existence tell us about us, right? And about, you know, how we use language and words, not just to describe, not just to categorize, not just to uh, uh, control uh, or master, but language as a way of giving witness to that vulnerability that we saw in that first piece. So I, I have two quick things to follow up with that. One is just a statement. The other is a question. You can respond to either one. 
you, know, you mentioned responding in prayer. One of the things that I find striking about the second revenge piece is that the style is very different from the first. It has a lot more repetition. Uh, you have, for example, a line, I'm just going to sort of read off the, the quickie translation we have here. But the fact that these execrable creatures are crucifying their son of God comforts him in his pain. So that's something that we see repeated a couple of times. We see several phrases repeated a few times, which makes it a very liturgical prayer, which of course is a communal act. This isn't the sit alone in your room and contemplate it. This is something we all recite together, which is a very different approach to prayer than maybe you would have gotten from, say, Protestant missionaries or things like that. So that's that's one comment. The second is a question. So in both pieces, you have a crowd. One of the abiding things, one of the abiding questions I always have when I come back to Wild Grass is who's the audience for this piece? All Chinese people? This is such a bizarre series of writings. It's hard to imagine him thinking, everyone's going to dig this. This is for everyone, right? How does the public, how does the crowd in each of these revenge pieces match up with or maybe not match up with the possible audience for the real pieces themselves? I think that's an excellent question. And I think um, we don't, I don't know if I'll ever know who the audience was for. <laughs> it's not, right? Right. Um, you know, like it, it was, it, and I think this is part of the difficulty. Like Lucian is gesturing to a possible audience, a speculative audience, but then it's very hard to kind of nail down who that audience would be. He who has eyes to see and ears to hear, as it says in the Bible. Who would enjoy reading this? And I think, um, you know, you're pointing out this kind of like this per- this prayer in the midst of taking pleasure in, in the depravity of humans and the depravity of people you know i'm reminded of the end of uh camus uh, l'étranger the stranger when Musso is is convicted uh and he's going to be executed for uh for, for murder and he says that you know he's going to welcome the cries uh the the shouts of those who are celebrating his execution right uh and i think what's interesting about that is is this again this complicity this complicity of the crowd, the complicity of, of humans, but it is precisely in in delving into that that one actually uh, is able to access the sacred and divine, not by tearing ourselves away from this, right? So we could think of, you know, if we think of a kind of stereotypical, you know, church uh, gathering where everyone's in their best Sunday dress, you know, all behaving, you know, properly, you know, calling each other's ma'am and sir, you know, the stereotypical kind of like, you know, like, you know, prim and proper. This is not that, right? But I think the argument is that this is where, if we're going to talk about God, this is where it's to be found. It's in the muck uh, and, and the hypocrisy of what it means to be human. Now, going back to that second question about spectator, I think, you know, it rewards those who can see themselves in both the crowd and the hero. Um, so, so, or in, in the first revenge piece, that, that we are both the two people who are about to, you know, are not precipice, as we are the gawking crowd, right? And I think, you know, previous interpretations to talk about, you know, Lucian's skepticism of the crowd as being you know, violent and being mob-like, so in some ways, maybe reads it too categorically that it doesn't read that. In fact, it's a it's it's not that there's the individual hero who must block himself from uh, uh, the imperatives of the crowd. It's the fact that there's always going to be that antinomy, right, of the of the mass and then the individual, right. But those two things kind of uh, cohere together, and so I think it rewards those who are willing to see ourselves and imagine ourselves in all the different positions both the, uh, the Israelites uh, and, I mean, really should be the Romans who condemned Jesus, Jesus himself, and then the crowd that watches, and then perhaps even God, right? Um, and th- so I think that's a more productive reading of it than to say that Lucian is trying to lay out, you know, who is the good guy and who is the bad guy here, right? It's very clear in the text, in, the, in, in this kind of blurring of, uh, man of God and man of humans, right? If if Jesus is the is the is the man of, of uh, is a son of uh, uh, a son of man, then he's a son of the very crowd that's mocking him and jeering at him. Right? You, you can't divorce that. Right. right. And I think that's what lends, I think, a more speculative reading of this text rather than a categorical antinomial reading that tries to say, oh, you know, here's the good Jesus who's being so pilloried by, by the crowd. 
you know, the, the sacrality is the totality of the scene, right? That's what gives the crucifixion in this reading its power, right? It's because it's happening in the midst of, you know, the passion happens in the midst of the people who are throwing things at Jesus, mocking him, harming him, right? If people were just kind of politely watching <laughs> the Calvary, <laughs> right, the, right. The, the road to the cross, you know, uh, it, w- it wouldn't be that interesting, right? It wouldn't be, it wouldn't have its transcendent power. It's precisely because it's happening in the throes of agonistic passion. You know, I, I, yeah, I, I can't help but think about our present politics today, you know, certainly in the U.S., but also in Europe and, and, and other places where, you know, we're just seeing the unleashing of of just primitive passions and primitive anger and and conspiracy theories and 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 threats of violence you know this has become so like pretty mainstream unfortunately and and we would hope to return to some past we were all polite to each other right you know that is kind of the liberal democratic order you know but i think um i think it's good for us to kind of understand that there is something fundamentally human about those throw those agonistic throws of of intemperate violence, that we're all capable of doing this, unfortunately. And it, that doesn't take much, as we have seen, right? right. You know, I, I've, I've tried to, you know, when I, when I talk about like, you know, the capital rights to my students, you know, I don't talk about it a lot, but once in a while, I, I don't try to just condemn. I try to understand, you know, like, my question is not, you know, like, if I'm just saying that they're just horrible or awful, then, then we get nowhere, and then that's pointless. My interest is how does one get to that stage, and how can it happen to me? Right? Because there's something fundamentally human about that. And it's precisely in kind of reckoning radically with the complexity of this humanness that we approach also uh, the sacred. Hmm. That's a good way to put it. I think uh, we should probably start to wrap it up. It's it, this has been a fascinating discussion, and and like our other interviews on this series, it went on far longer than it felt. It, it's totally uh, worth it. It feels like we've only been talking with you for fifteen minutes, uh, Professor Chan. If there's one thing you think the reader should take away from the either Lucian's Wild Grass as a whole or these particular passages, what would it be? Um, perhaps as a whole is, is, is I hope it, it, it gives a, a reappreciation of Lucian, not simply as someone who was, uh, quote, worried about China, unquote, right? Um, but, I mean, of course he was, right? But that Lucian is also someone who's very concerned about the space that we give ourselves to dream as a way of worrying about China or worrying about our world or worrying about our personal lives, right? That, 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 that part of that work is not simply to bracket off, you know, these more fanciful, speculative, dreamlike uh, 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 terrains, but to embrace them into our everyday reality. Right. And this is something that I think very early on Lucian is clear about is that if literature doesn't give us that space, if literature and art doesn't give us that, that, you know, that tether that allows us to do it, then literature is good for nothing. He is truly someone who understands that the universal is to be found in the particular, it's to be found in the muck of the here and now, of the passions of the present, uh, in the agony. Um, uh, in the struggle to survive and to be human in whatever time you're in, right? And I think that's that's what makes Lucian so interesting and so valuable is that he's playing both sides. He's saying that you need both, right? You, you need both critical realism. You, you, you need the, the, the gumption to critique reality as you see it, uh, to be brave and to do that. But you also need the ability uh, to dream. And, 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 to, and to speculate and to, and to uh, you know, envision a possible future, to envision uh, values and norms and not just in an instrumental utilitarian sense. And so I think that's, that's what I hope people get out of Lu Shen because I don't think it's something that we teach enough for our, our, in our classes about Lu Shen. Um, you know, we, we, teach him, we teach the referential Lu Shen, but we don't teach enough of the speculative Lu Shen. Uh, Rob, I, I think that's a pretty good place to end it. Is that okay with you? I'm not going to add anything to that. That's great. You know, I, I guess we can just sign off by saying we hope 
you uh, have sweet dreams or, or maybe not so sweet, hopefully, hopefully not dreams of, of, of people like skeletal figures fighting <laughs> in, um, a, in a wasteland and trying to stab each other. <laughs> hopefully not those dreams, but useful dreams anyway. Professor Chan, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, it, it's been a ball and it's been really uh, enlightening. If I can use that word about such dark pieces. I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast.